When I was in seminary, one of my classmates shared this little story with me, and it stuck with me, and it's perfect for this morning. It goes this way. A young novice was studying to become a monk in a monastery, and he was seeking to understand the best way to pray, how to pray, the different ways he might be able to pray. And he went to his superior of the monastery and said, Father, would it be okay if I smoke while I'm praying? And the superior answered, Oh no, my son. Prayer is a holy conversation. And our attention should always be focused on God without distraction or invitation for distraction. So the young novice went away. And then a while later he came back and said, Ben, is it okay if I pray while I smoke? We have ideals about prayer, what it is and what it isn't, and what it ought to look like, as opposed to when we're pretty sure it's not happening at all. But many of these ideals are based on what we think God expects of us, what we think is prayer or acceptable prayer to God. But this morning, we heard in the gospel an undeniable direction from Jesus, unlike some of his other parables where we are sort of just sunk into the deep end to figure out what the heck we're supposed to take away from a complicated passage. This one is very clear. The very first sentence directs us to what we should be focusing on. This is about prayer. This is about our need to pray unceasingly always. But then we march into this story about this very unjust leader. He's so unjust and apparently oddly self-aware about his unjustness that he can reflect on this lack of compassion. And yet, the woman who is persistent in what she needs stays after him. She is relentless. She doesn't give up and she wears him down. And eventually, he grants her what she needs. And of course, the story of Jacob wrestling with the angel, which is more familiar to us, perhaps, than the gospel, is a story about Jacob who has a different idea about where he is going and how he's going to get there. And he argues in the form of wrestling. This is a full-on body contact kind of encounter with God. He's wrestling with a man. This is what we hear in the gospel, which later we understand to be an angel of God, if not God, God's self. And at the end of this wrestling, this full body contact encounter with God, Jacob is changed. He comes around to understand what it is that God wills for him, that he is not the same man who laid down to sleep earlier that evening. He's changed. He has a limp now. He has been formed as he has wrestled with God to understand what it is God is asking of him, the direction he is called into, and he will forever be different. That's formation. Prayer is, in the end, formation. It is an encounter with God that is forever and always shaping us toward more and more, deeper and deeper, communion with God. We tend to think of prayer as something that we do only when we are quiet and centered and calm enough to be open to God's voice and presence in our lives. And certainly, that is prayer. I myself seek that every morning. And we tend to think that that's prayer. This is prayer. But when we go outside, we're just living our lives. And perhaps we're collecting the things that we will then pray about when we are again in a quiet, calm, peaceful space. But these readings this morning are asking us to think very differently about prayer. Not how to pray, but what is prayer? And when is prayer? 
Prayer is, in fact, as Jesus said, something we do always and unceasingly. So what does prayer look like if we follow the example of Jacob wrestling with God or the persistent woman? What does it look like to stay after the thing that is worrying you, bothering you, causing you suffering, and taking it continually, relentlessly, persistently to prayer? It doesn't mean we're going to get exactly what we think we should have. It does mean that every time we take it to God, we are going deeper into a relationship with God and inviting that relationship to form us, to change us. But even more, what does it mean to wrestle with God? I love that image of Jacob just in full body contact with God. What does it mean to be riled up in prayer? What does it mean to be agitated into prayer? What does it mean to be so angry or irritated or frustrated that you are just in prayer? Now, if you're sitting there thinking, how do I do that kneeling in a quiet space? You don't. That, I think, it is the point. That in our day-to-day life, when we go outside the doors of this peaceful, peaceful space or the peaceful space of your home where you do your own prayer discipline, you're still, you're still in a space of prayer because you haven't left God behind. God is still with you. So when you're on that freeway and you get cut off or someone doesn't let you merge in, which is sometimes more irritating. It's like, really? Can you just let me in? How is that a prayer? How is that an opportunity to pray? pray? Not in the sort of formulas that we use in church, but just in conversation with God. Lifting it up for God and saying, I can't solve this problem. I, in fact, am pretty powerless right now. I would like to resist my urge to honk or worse, at this person. Help me. Teresa of Avila describes prayer this way. Nothing else than an intimate sharing between friends. It means taking time frequently to be alone with God, who we know loves us. Being alone with God doesn't mean in it being in a giant space all by yourself. It means you, wherever you are in a crowded, packed space, can still be alone with God in communion and in conversation. But even more, I love what she says about prayer being like in conversation with a friend. When you think about the conversations you have with your closest friend, you're thinking about someone who you can say just about anything to. And they will love you and support you. They may prod you a little bit and say, now, come on. You can probably have a kinder action there. But it's someone you trust. And someone you can bear your soul to without feeling that they're going to judge you or turn away from you. Your best friend in whom you confide is always enfolding you. So that's a wonderful image to think about God in prayer. When you're going about your day-to-day life, when you're riled up in prayer, when you're perhaps bored and still in prayer, you're with a friend. You're with someone who loves you so much, never judges you, and is never turning away. You are in relationship with God. So to think about prayer as a friend, we should be liberated to fully be ourselves, the way we are with our friends, the way we say to our friend after not seeing them in a while, I've missed you. There's so much I want to tell you that I can't share with anyone else. That's what prayer is. So you may be wondering, how then am I to pray over the course of my crazy schedule, my crazy life, my busy days or weeks? Well, the answer lies in what we are going to be doing in just a few minutes. The answer lies in renewing our baptismal covenant promises. 
And I'm going to just run us through very briefly what we're going to be renewing because I think you will begin to see how this all fits together. When we renew our baptismal covenant, we promise that we will resist evil. We promise to continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship. We promise to be examples of the good news of God in Christ. We promise to love our neighbors. We promise to strive for justice and peace, to respect the dignity of every human being. Is there anything here that doesn't touch some part of your life every single second of every single day? These covenant promises, I think, were designed to envelop our entire life all of our living, the good, bad, and the ugly. And they are meant to draw us into reflection at any time of any day. How is it that God is calling me to be in this moment? How can I pray to God right now when I feel so fill in the blank? There is no way in which these promises will cease to challenge us each and every day because they are what will shape us and form us into the body of Christ. So prayer is a persistent conversation with God. It is an unending conversation with God. Ultimately, it seeks to be seamless, such that at a certain point, we really have no sense of where we end and God begins, that we are in such a close communion with the holy. Prayer forms us. And over time, it forms us into an image of God, a reflection of Christ in the world, a light to shine in the dark, a glimmer of hope when all around seems in despair. Jim Finley is a deeply contemplative and religious man who is a clinical psychologist and has written a great deal about prayer. And this particular paragraph I think suits us well this morning. He says, since God is love, God's ways are the ways in which love awakens you again and again to the infinite love that is the reality of all that is real. As you ripen and mature on the spiritual path that meditation embodies, you will consider yourselves blessed and most fortunate in no longer being surprised by all the ways in which you never cease to be delighted by God. Your heart becomes accustomed to God, peeking out at you from the inner recesses of a task at hand, from the sideways glance of a stranger on the street, or from the way the sunlight suddenly fills a room on a cloudy day. It is in and through our baptism that eternal relationship with the divine, with God, that we are called to become more and more fully human in a God-touched way. Prayer is how this transformation takes place because prayer is at its deepest the boundless and timeless relationship with God that cannot be broken and that will never die.